start us so that we can uh, get everybody in. So thank you all. Thank, thank you all uh, for your patience. And, um, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. It's good to see everybody. Um, this panel is interrogating uh, Errol Henderson's The Revolution Will Not Be Theorized, published by State uh, SUNY Press, uh, 2019. It was one of two books that Errol recently published. It's not his most, it's not his last book. It's uh, the book before his last book. So Errol's put out uh, roughly three books in the last few, couple of years. Um, and we wanted to uh, showcase this work in order to introduce colleagues to it and also to um, put some uh, focus on Errol's body of work. And so we um, have this panel set up. Um, and you can see the order. Uh, uh, I'll go first, and my, my focus is on Errol uh, Henderson's Malcolm X. And each of us should take about 10 minutes, um, followed in order by Kathy Powers, Robert Smith, and then Errol, uh, I'm sorry, um, Lester Spence, and then Errol uh, will have the final say. Um, I've had the good exp experience of reading this book about five times, um, and also had a recent uh, review of it published in the APSR, I think it was, or in the, uh, um, um, sorry, Perspectives on Politics. Um, and this book is very uh, important because I think it, um, it, it intervenes um, a, a pattern and a trend in the discipline um, that we talk about or that I talk about in the forthcoming review of, of the discipline in terms of the study of black politics, black power and black nationalism. And Errol Henderson here has uh, dug deep in the well um, of scholars like um, uh, Elaine Locke and W.E.B. Du Bois uh, in order to bring out what he sees as uh, both methodological, but I think substantive argumentative uh, content shortcomings in the discipline, in black politics, in political science more broadly, um, to the extent that uh, uh, we've had these sort of half-baked uh, incomplete theories around black nationalism as function. And so what Errol has done, I think in this book most powerfully is brought together um, uh, a very uh, eclectic, um, uh, multi-layered uh, analysis of the uh, of black nationalism, through looking at how the students of Malcolm X, who embraced Malcolm as ideology itself, according to um, Dan Berger's book, the, the uh, article, the Malcolm X Doctrine, and in, in the study of the Republic of New Africa from Errol's beloved Detroit. Um, uh, and the, the uh, Malcolm X Society when they had the, the Black Government Conference in 1968. Um, and, um, and so, you know, Malcolm X, I even say this in my book that Malcolm X for some has become doctrine. Uh, he's become an ideology. Uh, and what Errol is trying to do, I think what he does very powerfully is almost immediately dispel, and this is what I mean by the multi-layeredness of it, both content and, and method, that Errol is methodologically trying to show us something. He's trying to teach us methodologically what he's talking about. He's doing the methodology, um, uh, but also, in other words, he's performing it almost, almost like a, like, you know, like Cornel West imagines himself as a, as a bluesman. Um, Errol is performing a, a methodological approach. Errol uh, does international relations. And Errol is um, trained at Michigan in, you know, in statistical analysis. He's a, a, a trained behavioralist. Yet his focus here is on black nationalism, which goes against the grain of the notion of its narrowness and its one dimensionality and its parochialism, parochialism uh, and its essentialism. Uh, uh, as again, Errol's approach is international first. He's an internationalist first. Uh, and he understands the layers and the centrality of black Americans in the American modern, uh, you know, mo mo modern state uh, and how we have a special role kind of as Du Bois understood, a kind of um, vanguardian role as Du Bois kind of understood our function. And I think to a lesser extent or different extent, King understood. But Errol right away dispels in the first two chapters any sort of um, hagiographic adherence to Malcolm X. And that's what I mean by him performing methodologically as well as substantively at the same time. He's doing two things at once constantly throughout the book. And so, Methodologically, he's trying to show people, I'm not wasting my time arguing about certain things. I want to get to the main point and I'll show you, but I'm not going to argue with you. And what he does is he, instead of arguing about Malcolm, Errol simply takes the first two chapters and interrogates Malcolm X. 
uh, and, 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 and actually opens the book somewhat surprising given if you know Errol already, uh, if you know his thinking, you know his ideology, you know his body of work, you know his love and appreciation for Malcolm and his fellow Detroiter, right? Uh, fellow Michigander, I guess I should say. But right away, the first two chapters turn Malcolm, uh, Malcolm X upside down and, um, and Errol um, is, is interested in uh, how Malcolm X has misread black political historical development uh, in, in the nation of Islam, partly theologically because of the nation's teachings, but also how that led to a, a subsequent misreading by the, by the black power generation. So they are misreading Malcolm's misreading. And Malcolm's reading uh, is what Errol ground, grounds in William Moses, his Penn, Penn State University colleague, the, the renowned historian, um, his approach to uh, sort of looking at early black nationalists like Blyden and uh, Garnett and um, uh, Crummel and how those people in Tunde Adeleke's work, um, Afri um, uh, uh, Tunde Adeleke's book, um, where he sort of talks about this whole process of Black Zionists and Black Zionism. Theodore Draper does the same thing. He sort of parses out Black nationalism and emphasizes a Black Zionism. Uh, uh, out of William Wilson's work, this notion of, of civil, civilizationism, this whole orientation in Black nationalist Christian ideology uh, of going to Africa to the benighted Africans and giving them Jesus. Um, Errol saying, Malcolm and others have made a mistake in looking at with an Afrocentric perspective first um, that does not look at the specific unique position of Black Americans in the American state. And so instead, so Malcolm kind of takes Du Bois upside down, where Du Bois in the beginning thinks that African Americans, you know, African Americans have something to offer Africa. Du Bois sort of comes around later and, and seems to think, unless um, that, 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 you know, that Africa would be the teacher, right? Malcolm comes along and sees the same kind of dynamic. Malcolm looks at Africa and says, you know, slavery has so denuded Black Americans that we should um, uh, embrace African culture, African, you know, history, African uh, knowledge, African ancestry, et cetera. Um, but that sort of turned it upside down in that this, Civilizationism um, is a, a missiological goal. It's a religious ambition to convert Africans. And that, according to people like Chief Alfred Sams, would also couple with capitalism and uh, try to challenge capitalism and make Africa strong um, to uh, give Black people who are enslaved a, a national or like, you know, other countries, an international sort of backup. Like Black America has Africa backing it up. And therefore, we can address the slavery issue more readily. What ends up happening is that these Christian mis Christian missionaries um, couple their ideology, Black nationalism, with uh, the, the mission. And this idea of elevation, Errol takes and, and says it's been turned upside down. And this idea of looking to Africa for Black American elevation, Errol says, is a mistake. Whether it's Elijah Muhammad, with the, with, the, with the Asiatic black identity, the Moors, with the Moorish Science Temple, uh, Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam, um, Martin Luther King and Gandhiism. All of these exotic reaches, you know, whether it's the Panthers reaching after Russia, Cuba and China. Errol saying, no, look at the slave insurrection of the, uh, that was the insurrection within, a a, it was a revolution within the Civil War. He's borrowing from um, people like Gerald Horn, uh, and Barrington Moore, who wrote the, uh, the, uh, the, the origins, the social origins of dictatorship and democracy at Harvard. And, and, and uh, Errol is joining a, a very unpopular view that was rejected even in Du Bois' own lifetime by most of his colleagues, the idea that the Civil War was a revolution within uh, was a, the black, there was a black revolution within the Civil War that the, that the slaves, three, and you saw the movie Glory, when 180 to 200,000 black men took up guns and killed white men, that would be revolutionary today. So Errol's saying that was revolutionary then within the Civil War. And then 350,000 black people walk off the plantations, according to Du Bois in Black Reconstruction. So Errol takes um, uh, Du Bois, Errol's interested in taking Du Bois and taking Elaine Locke 
and understanding that they're in, in you know, a, a, a good study of these two would show us the cultural potential of the slaves who deeply were a revolutionary population made so, or at least in part by their religion. Errol takes black religion seriously. And again, this is a man who does IR. This is a man who, um, who, 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 who's trained at Michigan, right? So, so he doesn't even have to touch this material if he doesn't want to professionally, but he understands his importance and he doesn't see it as separate from international relations or, or the empirical foundations that are required for social science research. And so Errol Henderson is trying to show social science and political science how to study black power how to study black uh, people's uh, political history and political development, both methodologically, th the method is subtle. The method in Errol's book that runs throughout the book is like a jazz man writing. And if you miss it, you'll, you'll only look for the writing and not understand he's showing you, I'm not arguing with everyone in the literature. Errol virtually ignores many of the people and scholars and, and literature that has sort of harped on black nationalism, shortcomings and racial so solidarity uh, uh, mobilizations. He just feels like that those arguments have been had and he's trying to move us to another level of analysis where we get to a point of a healthy approach in black political science of looking at black power in a way that is not pathological. And for much of our approach towards black power, we almost start negatively and try to find some hope in, in it. Errol is saying, we miss, you know, black the, the Black Power movement, except for the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and um, and Albert Cleek, who um, Errol uses his African name, uh, um, uh, uh, brother Albert Cleek. Uh, those are the two that get it right, and they're both from Detroit. They're both from Errol's home, and they get it right in terms of what he imagines the Black Church should be doing and what he imagines. Um, uh, you know, can come out of this kind of mobilization. He gets deep into Detroit, uh, into all of, uh, all of the Black Power organizations. Uh, but again, the one he prefer prefers is a League of, League of Revolutionary Black Workers. I'll stop here because we have plenty of other people that want to go on. I read this book. Again, if you want to see what I think of it in more detail, there's a new review of it in, the, um, in, the, in Perspectives of Politics, I believe, uh, that came out last month. So you can see it there. And then I talk about it Again, in May or May 5th, I have an article coming out um, of, of the review of politics called the, um, the, the Politics of Black Power, where I assess the entire discipline of black power. That article comes out May 5th, and I, I talk about Earl's book a lot in a lot more detail there. So I'll stop there as the chair, I have to have some discipline, and move on to the next pr presenter, which will be Professor Kathy Powers of the University of New Mexico, and we want to thank her because um, she came in uh, and is, is dealing with some things at home but, uh, in terms of a child, but she also was sort of brought in because we were trying to put the panel together and she stepped up with, and, uh, and we really appreciate you, Kathy, stepping up for us at, at the way you did. And, and so thank you. Can you unmute yourself? I guess. Okay, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and can I share the screen? Or, or uh, Now we're gonna I have problems gonna... because now that uh, uh, I would have if to- If not, make... that's okay. Yeah, I would okay, have to- Okay, then that's okay. I'll try to figure it out. Let's see here. Oh, no worries. I can just go ahead and get started. It's okay. not a problem. Okay. I'll just, I, just have, I just have pictures. That's we just all. have to make her a co-host. Um, <laughs> okay. Just make her a co-host and she can share a screen. Okay. Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, Does host disable participant screen sharing? Oh. Why would they ask me to do anything other than just stay here? Oh, then don't worry at all because I can just talk. Okay. Honestly, it's not. It's really not a problem. I'll uh, I'll send it to um, Dr. Henderson because there's pictures of him in there. Yeah, are you are you you muted yourself? Uh -oh. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you for recognizing the miracle um, that I'm standing here right now, <laughs> and um, it is an honor to be on this panel and to be able to talk about Dr. Henderson's work. I, know I only have 10 minutes. I tend to get going, so please stop me uh, if I go start going past that. Uh, my job is to talk about the human rights implications of the work. Um, if I have time, I'd like to talk about um, the implications also for reparations speaking today. Uh, for African-American reparations, the role of ADOS, the American Descendants of the South. And if not, we can save it for question and answer. I do want to say if I, if I have 
to walk away for a minute, I'll come right back. Um, I have a, a sick kid that I have to kind of watch out for. So what I want to say, first of all, and I think it's one of the most important sentences in the entire book is in the introduction. Uh, when Dr. Henderson says, I hope the work is indicative of the potential of those of us who arose from poverty and were not among those for whom many viewed an academic career as an option. This whole book, the work that he does stems from this, from the impossibility of the path that he actually achieved. And as a function of that, being able to understand politics differently. Not only to be able to see how domestic politics and international relations interact, which I'm also an international relations scholar who does this sort of work as well, but to recognize that there are multiple sources of theorizing and white supremacy and privilege, privilege is some path of theory making and does not recognize others. And he highlights this when he says repeatedly, and, and I've seen him speak about his work with black um, revolutionary theorists, it was their activism should be recognized fully theorizing to someone else. And that was profound. I'm from the inner city of Cleveland. So when I saw that sentence in the book, I was like, he's talking about me too. Many of us who come into political science especially those of us who are trying to chart our way in international relations, especially quantitative, that is dominated by white men, especially at the time that we both came along. And so I want to thank him for acknowledging that where he comes from informs the work that he does um, and for so many of us and to acknowledge that. Um, I think it's important for why he sees the world the way he does. I think we need to also recognize that coming from inner city Detroit, um, he was a veteran, he's an activist, he's a scholar, he's a teacher, and he's a mentor. He's not only been a mentor to me, uh, but many of us who are actually quite few in the study of international relations. Okay, so one of the things his book is getting at um, that I thought was profound, I've been thinking about a lot in the last couple of days is, he's talking about the sources of theory in academia which has been a privileged white male space. And so he's raising questions like, who has the right to have an idea? And I actually have a picture of like a single light bulb that's on and the others are not. Well, are they not on? Or do you only recognize this one and why this one? So who has the right to have an idea? How does it get recognized? Who has the power to decide which ideas matter and which ones don't? Where does can theory come from, which has been privileged in the ivory tower by white males primarily. And what I appreciate about Dr. Henderson's work is he recognizes the role of black women in activism and theorizing as well. And I'll say up front, I think one extension of his work would be to apply an intersectionality lens even further based off the arguments he's making about their role in activism and theorizing and to take it even, even further. He questions what constitutes theory making. And so on one hand, he does challenge the foundation of some of the BPM theses, but recognizes that they are theorizing that, that is driving activism and being influenced by activism. And that process should be recognized and respected. He asks who can be a theorist and who has the power and the right to decide who's a theorist and who isn't. Who has the power to form the ideas and theses that shape how we think and speak. And this is something that he said a couple of weeks ago. I'm um, gonna talk about his book at Clark Atlanta University that really kind of struck me is that white supremacism gives us the ideas and the language for how we think, speak, articulate, and conceptualize ourselves. So what does it mean that these revolutionary theorists were stepping outside of that to develop theory connected to activism using language um, that uh, for themselves that influenced thought and influenced practice recognizing that there was misreading along the way, but 
unpacking the process, which is really important. Who has the right to theorize about whom is a question that he inherently raises as well. And so one of the things he said at Clark Atlanta that just struck me is why aren't we reading ourselves? Why aren't we reading each other and talking about each other to talk about us? As opposed to citing literature and ideas grounded in white supremacy to think about our intellectual and activist processes. I thought that was quite profound. So his primary puzzle is um, the work of BPMM revolutionists have been around and it has been examined, interrogated in terms of activism, but not their acumen as revolutionary theorists. And that was profound for me because so many of us are academics and activists, and it is very difficult to take those two things apart. I was late to the game on the activism side, but it has profoundly changed how I think about theorizing and I think about work. And so I feel like his work is a reflection of our processes that we're not even aware of and brings it to the fore so that we are intentional and conscious about it, which it then guides who we look to to inform our work. This is so important because in political science today, referencing and bibliographies is a science. And if you don't reference the right work, it doesn't get published in the kinds of journals that count. So what does that mean? That means the work that we do, we do is often left out. So how do we then, if we are intentional and we recognize that our work is important, it should be recognized, cited, interrogated, can we then change the standards that have been and procedures that have been created in a context of white supremacy and academia? So he recognizes activism and theorizing, and he shows that what they're essentially interested in is change. And the way that these activists approach change is as instruments of change through activism and simultaneously as intellectuals through theorizing change. And you can't understand their role in Black radical change, change in the US without understanding that they are instruments and they are intellectuals simultaneously of change. He recognizes the role of culture, and he argues that previous work has focused on the political and economic aspects of their arguments, but has missed the cultural aspects of their revolutionary species. And so this is, it, it's, it's interesting that you know we're having this discussion today because yesterday I saw Stacey Abrams speak um, at a conference for uh, diversity officers, and one of the things that she was saying is culture is our entry point. Uh -oh. It's our starting point. Uh-oh, I'm over time? No, you're fine. Go ahead, you got like three minutes. Oh, okay, I heard, oh. <laughs> you're good. It, it, okay, it is our starting point. And so what he is saying is that the starting point, and he conceptualizes culture in a multi-dimensional space as you were talking about, James, is that he thinks about not only the aesthetic, but the material aspects and, make, and explores the argument, is it necessary to first have the cultural revolution to overturn the cultural white supremacy foundation to begin getting to political and, and economic demands of African-Americans. And which I wish we had time to even talk about terms because today activists, like Eidos are changing how we talk about each other and how we talk about ourselves by talking about Black Americans as direct descendants of enslaved Africans. And that defines who is in the reparations movement and then who is not our other people, immigrants from um, the African continent and from the Caribbean who are defined out. And so we have a time in which the African diaspora within the United States is being pulled apart by definitions of reparations, which I would love to hear him talk about. In terms of, of human rights, um, oh, 20, 10 minutes, I'll just 
try to stay up here a little bit, is um, recognizing that these revolutionaries were interested in change and the recognition and obtaining human rights for individuals, individual Black Americans, but also what does it mean um, in terms of self-determination and claims of a Black nation in the United States? This really gets us into, and I saw, and this is the one that really stuck with me, and I, I know I'm skipping some stuff, is when he says, they are influenced by Pan-Africanism, but should there be one strategy sort of for all of us that for individuals who are seeking self-determination in a country and potentially the control of the apparatus of the state, is that effort and the strategies that are required to do so similar to the effort of revolutionaries in the United States who are seeking freedom and representation and the recognition of human rights within the United States. Um, Errol and I used to fight over definitions a lot when we taught at Penn State together. And we were like, sister and brother, it was real. But I have to, and I want to acknowledge in front of everyone, you were right. <laughs> it took an extra, what, 15 years for me to understand what you were trying to tell me, which was we can't have single theories that explain everyone. Let's be in control of the words and the language that we use to describe ourselves um, in order to be able to better theorize. And what he's saying is you can't necessarily use Pan-Africanist theory, although important in the diaspora, to guide the efforts in the United States. So why is this so important? It's because since the Reconstruction period, this is the first time that reparations for African Americans have been part of the discourse in a presidential election. And Ados, the American descendants of the South, have been able to amass political power, change the discourse, um, force mainstream politics to recognize reparations, and has also um, been very clear about the theories that are guiding their efforts and how they define reparations what, and who counts and who doesn't. And I think these efforts today require a similar analysis. Eidos is very clear about who's included, who is not, and these are efforts focused clear, clearly on the United States. And so I think we need a lens that look at efforts of the past to help us understand how they are still being influenced or having an impact today. And how are these new efforts theorizing? How are they different? How are they similar? And I'll stop, stop there because I think I might go over. If I could just say two more things. One, right, if, right. if he, he, I can't, okay, two things that I just want to say that he's really raising the question of is, and, um, Another theorist, uh, Belinda Wallace, has also raised this question. Who controls the apparatus of the state? And who controls the apparatus of the state has a huge impact on the venues available in international relations and domestically for rights seeking. Where individuals can go and states can go are also mediated by international law. So states can go to the International Court of Justice. Many of the strategies in the African-American community actually go more and more local because of lack of success within the state and not being able to seek reparations, for example, and rights in the International Court of Justice because they're not states. So he raises the question of what is the importance of the apparatus of the state and activism and theorizing? And I'll stop there. Thank, thank you so much. We'll move on next to um, Robert Smith on the theses of reverse civilization. This one. Dr. Smith, you have to un, uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. You're good. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to first uh, salute Brother Arrow for the breath of his work. He's one of the few African-Americans 
in the area of international relations, which he has made good contributions, I still find useful his Afrocentrism in rural politics, called was toward a new paradigm. And it really is uh, toward a new paradigm. And watching the Biden administration grapple to try to come up with a foreign policy distinctive from the last administration, uh, I would want to encourage the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor to take a look at, at that book and that new paradigm because they seem to be stuck in the past. Earl has also, of course, made contributions to African-American politics, uh, as this book is. Contributions to recovering intellectual history of Blacks in African studies and national relations. Uh, so I like the, that can use the phrase, the Catholicism of, of, his, of his scholarship. And I just want to take this opportunity to uh, salute him for that. And then express my personal appreciation for his giving us at the State University of New York Press the good opportunity to publish the volume in the uh, African American Studies series, which I've been editing for some number of years. Of course, he had other places he might have put the book. And so I'm glad he gave us that consideration. So thank you, Bob. Now I want to get to the topic at hand. I don't want to say anything about reverse civilization, Malcolm's uh, reverse civilization. The chapter in that is done very well and makes a point that I uh, fully agree with and that James uh, touched on uh, in his presentation. I want to talk about two things. Uh, the revolution will not be theorized. I take that point, but my first reservation is whether the revolution could have been materialized, whether revolution was possible. And then I want to engage Earl a little bit in the panel, a little bit in my perennial uh, dispute with him and one of his mentors, Brother Harold Cruz, about this role of culture and the church, if I have time to get to all of this. So let me begin with uh, revolution. When I was in college in the late 60s, I was at Berkeley, and uh, revolution was in the air. We actually, I actually, and my cohorts actually believed there was a possibility of a black revolution. I was at Berkeley, there was constant protest and the Black Panther Party was just down the street. And they would come to the campus and we would go to the Panther. And uh, even uh, Someone as conservative as uh, Robert Dole up at Yale had to take a little book called After the Revolution. He talked about this notion of revolution being the N word. And uh, we, we, we were misguided. I, I don't think there was any chance of a revolution pulled off by anybody in the United States. We read Fanon. Fanon was our kind of Bible. We saw the rebellion in Detroit as a precursor to urban guerrilla warfare and watched the Battle of Algiers and thought this would give us some lessons as to how to make revolution. Uh, but more so than Fanon, we read Herbert Marcuse, then down at UC San Diego. Macuza was Angela Davis, his major professor. And he wrote a number of books, 
One of his books is called One Dimensional Man, in which he argued that revolution was impossible in modern industrial societies because those societies had the, the ability to deliver the goods and forestall any kind of a co-op, any kind of revolutionary center. He held out the possibility, Makusa did, that Blacks might be a revolutionary force. He called Blacks the, the substratum of the, uh, of the oppressed in America, and they might be a revolutionary force. This, of course, is what the, the Balts is, Grace and James. Uh, uh, Errol talks about this. They saw Blacks as a possible revolutionary force. So I want to raise that question. I have a quote here from my brother, Ron Walters, uh, writing uh, after this period, this period of revolutionary possibilities. And Ron said, we are a minority, we Black people, in a highly urban, technological oriented society. And no revolution has yet been made in such a place especially by a highly identifiable minority of its citizens who do not have some control of the mechanism of force. The problem of violent confrontation with the system of white power is from a base of powerlessness and will only lead to more repression. So he dismisses the possibility of revolution and so my question is, I think the implication of the book is, if the revolution had been properly theorized, it could have materialized. That there was a possibility if, 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 if the revolutionaries of that day had got it theory right. And Lenin said, without correct revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary practice. I think that's the kind of implication here. So I'd like Errol to touch on that. Could the revolution, if properly theorized, materialized? And then my second uh, uh, point uh, is this cold question of culture. Earl and I have quibbled about this off and on for years. <sighs> Revolutionary culture, can culture, can cultures that are not revolutionary be transformed into revolutionary cultures? And if so, how? Uh, I, I, I see cultures as inherently, any culture, any place, as inherently conservative, as inherently static, as inherently resistant to revolution. And that it is almost impossible to have a cultural revolution. I'm talking about culture now in the lived sense of culture, not the aesthetic sense, but the lived sense of culture. Uh, much of the book hinges on this notion of, of, of properly using the materials of African American culture to become, to, become a, to become a revolutionary force, a revolutionary factor. And of course, central to uh, African-American culture is religiosity and the church. And it all focuses on that and seems to see some revolutionary potential in the church. And I, I don't see it. The church to me is, 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 is black church, but churches generally is a conservative, you know, the Marxist notion of what is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of, 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 of religion and society? It's a conservative force. It's a narcotic. It's a narcotic. That's particularly the case with the black church, in, in my view. Martin Luther King used to say over and over again during the civil rights movement that there are so many Negro churches and so many Negro preachers have never opened their mouths about the civil rights movement. In fact, the, the black church at the time, King's civil rights movement, was under the control of this autocratic Reverend J.H. Jackson out of Chicago, who was anti-civil rights. And the King had to break away and create the Progressive Baptist Convention to get a few preachers to become involved. So I have a problem with first this notion of the possibility of cultural revolution, of culture being a basis for revolutionary change, which I think is a major thesis of the book. And second, I have concerns about if you talk about black culture, you necessarily have to put the church at the center of it. 
And then I have this notion that the church past and present, and I would even hazard to say the future, is likely a conservative force in black politics. Brother Cleese in Detroit, of course, was an exception, he tried to break away from that. A few other cases around the country where black preachers uh, took on liberation theology and that kind of thing. But I, I still, I still I want to raise some questions about that. So again, I think it's I, I'll be I'll be I'll be reading this book like I read uh, Hal Cruz, uh, which is Earl's mentor. I read Cruz. I've been reading Cruz since 1967, and every now and then I'll go back and I'll read it again. And of course, there's something else that I learn almost every time I read it. So I suspect I'm going to have the, have this battle with the, the revolution that will not be theorized in the same way I had with Cruz as the crisis of the Negro intellectual. Because of Cruz, Cruz also, of course, placed extraordinary emphasis on the importance of culture and revolutionary and change in Black America. So uh, thank you, Brother Earl. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you for your analysis, Dr. Smith. Uh, we'll move on now to Lester uh, uh, Spence from John Hopkins University. You can un unmute yourself, Lester. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to take approximately one minute. Uh, one year ago uh, today, the, the world ended as we know it. Uh, in my own case, I lost approximately, I think I stopped counting, but it was around 15, 16 people. All those folk were black. I think all those folk were in Detroit. Um, so I'm gonna take uh, about 30 seconds or so. All right, I'm gonna take a, uh, because I, I time, time myself and I really wanna to get to the conversation. So there are a lot of things that I plan to say, but I'm, um, I'm not uh, gonna. Uh... Earl Henderson's work represents a culmination of over three decades of scholarship and activism. What I actually wanna do is situate Earl's work within a longer trajectory uh, that actually be, I would argue begins uh, in approximately 1969 with the first Black Action Movement at the uh, University of Michigan. Uh, black students uh, from Detroit, surrounding areas, with, uh, with, along with comrades, uh, took over the University of Michigan and through their work created the conditions for um, the Center of Afro-American uh, and African Studies. Uh, uh, Harold Cruz was, their, was either their first or second director uh, then there was a second Black Action Movement uh, between 1974, 1975, and 1977. Uh, again, the same kind of constellation of forces. In that case, you had one Black political scientist who was act actively involved with that dynamic. That was Cedric Robinson, the author of Black Marxism. When people talk about Cedric Robinson, they primarily associate him with the University of California, Santa Barbara, but he actually had a stint at the University of Michigan. He was the one of the few black faculty I'm aware of that students could actively go to. It's that program that actually created the conditions where uh, by the University of Michigan opened up to a range of working class black students. They end up creating a number of centers for um, a number of, of, of way, uh, spaces for black faculty to, be, fa faculty to be hired. And then there were a couple of like service centers they created for administrators and for students. I'm actually a direct product of that. I was involved. I came to Michigan through, uh, through the bridge program. That bridge program was a creation of that second black action movement. Uh, the third black action movement happens approximately 1986, 1987. Earl Henderson by this time is in graduate school. He is one of the founders slash leaders of that effort. Earl can correct me if I'm wrong, there were at that time black faculty who were at the University of Michigan, but there were no black faculty 
that those students involved in that student takeover could look to. They may have performed privately, but I'm not aware of, you know, I'm pretty familiar of Michigan history being a Michigan guy. I'm not aware of any black faculty who was directly involved in that stuff. So you had the black, uh, that third black action movement. And then alongside you had uh, the, uh, a coalitional uh, effort, uh, UCAR, the United uh, Coalition Against Racism. Uh, Kathy Cohen was a member slash leader uh, involved in that way. So you had a nationalist wing basically and an integrationist wing. Uh, Earl took that moment, I'd argue, and consistently used that moment and his activism in those spaces he would go on to help found Wayne State's Africana Studies Department. Uh, I believe he helped reconstruct Penn State's Afro-American Studies program. I could be wrong there. And I think he was also involved at the University of Florida. I know he's employed there, but I think he was, he may have been involved there as well. He'll correct me if I'm wrong. He always does. Um, I, what we see with Earl's work consistently is him using struggle to actually help inform his politics and, and his political science. Now, Kathy mentioned that there are a number of us who are activists and academics. I gently push back and say there aren't. I'd say that there are a number of us who claim activism and they articulate themselves as activists. But when you look at their actual behavior, you don't see what we would think of as activist work, right? You see our articulation of activism, but that's different than actually being an activist and being an organizer, right? Similarly, going back to what, uh, you know, what, what, what I really appreciate about the work is what it creates for black politics. Similarly, while we are now at the moment that I'm willing to bet none of us thought we would get to, where if we were gonna talk about black politics as a subfield, we are finally at the point where black politics as a subfield is taken seriously within the discipline. We no longer have to count on one hand the number of articles published about black life in any of the major, uh, any of the major journals. There was a moment in time not that long ago where we, where, where we could name them. We don't have to talk about editorial boards anymore. We don't have to talk about the highest, uh, the highest tiered academic um, presses. We don't have to talk about them anymore. They're all far more integrated, although not as much as we like, they're now far more integrated than they were to the extent that that ranking stuff matters. You look at the top 10, top 15 political science departments, most of them, if not all of them, have a black politics specialist or have a racial politics specialist. And in fact, many of them have more than one. I mentioned Kathy Cohen's earlier. University of Chicago now has Kathy Cohen, Michael Dawson, Adam Getachew, uh, Patricia Posey, and I'm probably forgetting a couple of folks. That wasn't not that was not something that we would imagine possible back in the day. But what's the challenge? The challenge and I got three minutes left. The challenge is that if you look at that black politics, that black politics has not has actually consistently been backwards and behind actual black life. They've taken no we because I'm in that. We've taken a number of questions seriously and thrown political science methods at these questions, but these questions are largely, if not solely, questions derived in response to the major discipline. So in that way, we've been following the discipline rather than leading it. So we've been in a way behind as far as the discipline, and then we've been behind on the ground. So if you look at the major APS article, articles published by Black folk, if you even go beyond the major, you go back 30 years to any article or any journal, what you're going to see is far less of a focus on police state violence than was present in the Journal on Political Repression. Kelly Harris is here. The Journal of Political Repression on Political Repression was the first journal created by the National Conference of Politi uh, Black Political Scientists. It only lasted, from what I understand, at one or two, maybe three issues. But that journal focused, took a laser-like lens and examined how Black, how black people were actively being oppressed 
by the police in a number of different cases. If you look at APSR and any, again, we, I'm just focused on the elite stuff, but we don't have to do this, from approximately 1999 to 2010, until people start taking the carceral state seriously, what you see amongst all of us is a focus primarily on attitudes of Black folk, again, trying to ask questions that the discipline brings to us rather than questions that we, that we bring to the discipline. What Errol's work does is in the minute and 30 seconds I got left is he flips that. He flips that. And, and, and as an aside, and, and this is the important aside, I'm talking about political science and the way I articulate that, it can make it seem as if this is a racial thing because black politics scholars are, in vain, are intervening against a larger discipline that isn't black. We can take that same approach to black studies. That is all black. That is, if we look at the fundamental questions that Black studies as a discipline was consistently taking up, you would see that they too are actually behind active Black life. We're all trying to catch up. So Black people were being uh, victimized by state violence in the, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, et cetera. You won't see, it, was, it would be as if none of that happened. Based on, uh, based on the literature. What Earl's work does is it brings black life back into the center, but it does so by taking politics seriously. And by that, I mean, taking the skill set that we have been given as political scientists and then using that to actively think through how politics should be conducted. It's not a black study set, uh, conception of political science in which everything is, is subsumed under politics. It's not a black studies conception of revolution or nationalism. Give me a few more seconds. It's not a, uh, it, it's, it's, it's something that's deeply, deeply informed by the discipline. But then again, it takes the discipline and flips it on its head. And then finally, it is about operating from a position of black cultural power rather than dysfunction. If you think about the Afro-pessimist term, if you turn, if you think about the focus in black studies on black life, even as black folk have been trying to contest the idea that black folk in America are culturally inferior, they consistently reproduce it by focusing on things like the uh, like the Civil War and are, and placing the slave at the center. He actually presents kind of a historical materialist informed notion of black life that's not dysfunctional. And then finally, it, it, as, uh, as, as clear as he is in kind of articulating and reorienting black politics, he does so not solely with the, cha with the uh, purpose of changing the academy and how we study it. He does it with a, with, a, uh, with a notion of changing the world. And again, and I'll end with this, you can see this in his actions, right? So there's, there's a clear way to, to, to distinguish the folks who say they're activists and academics and folks who actually are activists and academics. And Errol talked about this, you know, significantly several times when he's been giving talks in his book. It's like, what are they doing on their yard? So I named, I know every place Errol's worked, Errol's worked on every yard he's been in on behalf of Black folk. I am here because of the activism of Errol Henderson and others. So on that note, I'm out. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Lester, and thank everyone uh, for their contributions to this conversation. Um, we're gonna uh, move quickly to allow Errol time. We have about 22 minutes. If Errol, you could take about 12, 13, 14 and give us the rest of the, to the audience, that would be great. Um, uh, just real quick, one of the things that uh, Lester brought to mind that I don't think it was mentioned yet is uh, Errol's work with the LA gang truce in the 1990s. That was really important. Uh, the other thing is his current situation. Uh, without going into too much detail, if you don't know, ask somebody. Errol, Errol right now nationally is one of the, he's doing what, uh, what Lester is saying about, you know, on the yard. Errol right now is, uh, you know, standing up for the black community uh, and um, at Penn State. And uh, people thought he was out there on his own. And now we're seeing the whole institution. Things have happened where he's been proven right in front of the whole institution and the institution doesn't know what to do. Um, because the racism has come around and met them. 
it's come full circle with the little girls online using racist things um, that embarrass Penn State um, and a number of other things have, ha have happened. Errol has stood to his, uh, his ground. And so he's not just doing it, you know, when he was young, when he was 28, you know, when he was 22, uh, when he was 19 at Michigan, this man's life is consistent. He is still um, active, you know, being an activist scholar at Penn State right now as, as we speak. And so I'll stop there and let you uh, say what you wanna say in response to these over uh, these views, um, these, uh, these uh, perspectives, and then we'll allow the, uh, uh, the audience to ask any questions. And, and a couple of questions have been submitted and we'll try to get to them. Okay, uh, Asante San, I, I, I'll try to be as brief as I can, but uh, I so appreciate you all for organizing this and for the folks who come out to it, and especially to uh, brother uh, James Taylor, who I affectionately call JT, who uh, encouraged me to do this. This is, I've written five books. I've never had a session like this before. And I'm so appreciative of, of, of you all who've, uh, who've joined and especially the panelists uh, for your presentations. I, I just, uh, I'm, um, ah, I'm almost speechless, almost. Um, <laughs> but uh, so let me uh, 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 do justice to what you all- Don't nobody, don't nobody, don't nobody who you know believe that. Go <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so let me do justice to uh, the efforts you all put forth to make those analyses and do my best to respond to them. But uh, I want to first uh, uh, make the point that uh, JT just enforced. Uh, if you want to appreciate the situation here at Penn State, please just Google being black at Penn State, which is the op-ed I wrote about the racism at Penn State. Uh, there's been 3% African-American faculty for 30 years. I'm the first. And until last year, uh, the only tenured African-American in the history of the political science department. So the United States had a black president before Penn State is, uh, has um, a tenured a full professor in political science. We now have a uh, sister, uh, Candace uh, Watt-Smith, who is the first uh, sister to ever be tenured at Penn State and Roy Block. Um, and um, uh, I also want to say uh, the first use of force, the first uh, use discharge of police weapon in state college, which is overwhelmingly white, uh, killed uh, Osage, Osage, and this is the, the second year, there's a group here, the 320 Coalition that we've been organized with. We had thousands of folks out here in the streets organizing and marching and protests of the police killings. Um, and these are overwhelmingly white. So when we talk about challenging folks and your activism, uh, a, a sister once told me, she was about 80 then. She said, uh, she said, Errol, I, I never liked uh, when people say what uh, they did in their time. She said, as long as I'm alive, it's my time. And I would always, kiss her cheek and say, and long thereafter. And she was organized with us in the late 80s, early 90s. Her name was Rosa Parks, okay? So, so the people who talk about what they did in their time, I got I, no, 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 okay, let me just get to this. Okay, the, so to the point, I owe such a huge debt to Brother Smith. Hey, don't, don't let Brother Smith front on this now. Brother Smith, he gave me some of the best advice on publishing the book. And he was so straightforward about it. He said, yeah, this and this, I can see why you do this. He said, but, uh, but we, 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 we want you, we want to come back. And, um, and he was such a source of encouragement and, uh, and, and challenge. And that's what folks want, you want your work to be challenged. And brother Robert Smith in his book, uh, We Have No Leaders, it's still a classic. It's still undersighted in the, in the discipline what Ron Walters used to call a, a, a footnote apartheid and we call it biblioside. But Robert Smith's work is this a uh, phenomenal. Um, and just hold a huge debt. I want to say Harold Cruz was not my mentor. He would, he would be surprised if anybody said that. We used to kick it, me and Harold Cruz. I'm an international relations scholar. Much of my work, just like Kathy Powers, uh, in quantitative analysis of international relations. And that's important because like Kathy, I don't come around and make a fetish of the so-called international. We don't fetishize it because we study it. This was our point of departure. So we appreciate, for example, um, folks who decorate nationalism from international. Anybody know, anybody study nationalism, know that nationalism is at once an international engagement, usually because you're making a claim for self-determination against another nation state. So to create nationalism is to be engaged in international relations, okay? Often folks will use international because they don't want to say uh, a Marxist international or the socialist international or they want to, again, fetishize it, or when they get to positive aspects of progressive and revolutionary Black nationalism, they want to attribute it to something else. But we'll come back to that. I want to go back to, um, so I want to make that point about international relations scholars. Um, uh, uh, Cruz, Harold Cruz is so important. He was the founding director of the center at, at Michigan. But Cruz said one of the limitations in his uh, the crisis of the, of the cultural uh, crisis of the Negro intellectual was uh, what, we didn't control media. 
Now we have an era of social media. Folks asking, what's the relevance of Cruz? Folks not asking, what's the relevance of Altazar? You know, they still study Altazar. They don't like Cruz because he says some mean things about uh, Lorraine Hansberry. But Altazar killed his wife, and they still cite Cruz. But this is how frivolously they treat Black scholars. This incredible analysis he put forth for the phenomenon. And Cruz was not posing a universal theory. This is a holdover from both white supremacy and patriarchy. You don't study the world, and some of us do international relations, but you're gonna propose a theory for revolution throughout the world, you know what I'm saying? So it's a humbling thing. Cruz is trying to revolutionize the civil rights movement. He is not fetishizing culture. He's saying there's a strategic use for culture. And then he talks, and I talk about that in the piece, right? Okay, so, but let me get to this. I so appreciate what uh, Brother JT going in order. The, 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 when you said the method is like a jazz man playing and it's subtle, I so appreciate that. And I mean, Malcolm said the freest person, freest black person was the jazz man, you know, how he imp improvised on his horn. But, but, but even in the, from the aesthetic to the material, you remember this, the, the, that, that picture of the Madonna and Child, the Shrine of Black Madonna, and it's painted by Glanton Dowdell, who had done a, the time at Jackson Prison. You know who's holding the paint and brushes while Glanton is uh, painting that? General Baker, a legal revolutionary black worker. This is a Marx, black Marxist organization, the legal, but they paint and Reverend Cleavis, Cleavis Church. So to jump ahead, so Brother Smith, I don't say it's cultural revolutionary, it's the church revolutionary, they're not. The issue is under what condition can they be made to be revolutionary? That's what black reconstruction is talking about. When Du Bois said the slaves imagined the coming of the Lord, Du Bois mysticized it. So I talk about how you can augment Du Bois with Locke and an and a, and a, and a understanding of slave hiring, which sort of gives a sense of working and national consciousness to slave, slave hiring and the phenomena of, um, uh, and, and the transformation of slave religion. So it was those two. You don't need everybody. You don't need, you just need committed cadres dedicated to revolutionary objective. Show me a revolution in the world that's been uh, 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 organized by masses of people. No, they're committed cadres who then then organize. Okay, but we can come back to that. But uh, I appreciate that for Brother Taylor and, 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 and Sister Powers, just appreciate that. Uh, again, it dovetails with that no, no, uh, no single theory that's universal. And Sister Powers, don't let uh, Dr. Powers, uh, 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 don't, don't let her mislead you. A lot of those arguments, uh, she won. And I got the little fist prints on my chest to prove it when she won and like, get out of my office there. Eh? <laughs> But Dr. Kathy Powell is one of the most serious scholars in international relations. I cited and build on her work. My, my, uh, my book, uh, uh, African Realism, builds on her thesis. She's one of the first ones to demonstrate the security protocols embedded in, uh, on, in, um, in regional trade agreements. Her analysis, she's one of the first to demonstrate empirically that the democratic peace thesis does not hold in Africa. She has done that. Um, and, and she deserves credit for that and the centering on her, on her work. She's also a remarkable sister, that too, okay? But I'm just talking about her scholarship, okay? Um, and um, I appreciate her engagement on who can be a, a theorist. And, and I really, to jump back to JT, I really appreciate the continuity you show in my work. Sometimes you have a better sense of this than I, than I do, but I'm only a Russian just for time. So, um, and I appreciate uh, Sister Kathy's point about extending the analysis intersectionally even further. And I, I like it. And Brother Smith challenged me on this. Um, and as you see, when 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 women theorists emerge in the in the story, you can see I had to pick and choose. I didn't add women and stir. They're there. So, but the issue is not what do you do when them there. It's how do you miss it? How do you not include? How do you not include Mary Shadke? How do you not include Lucy Parsons? How do you not include Callie House? How do you not include Claudia Jones? How do you miss the cool and Jerry Safi Bukhari? How do you miss them? Okay, so um, so I want to say this is also a lot of the people that I'm writing about. I said or at their feet to learn, and I listen and I apply and to build on their work. So I'm constantly saying I'm not mad at these folks. I'm trying to build on their work instead of doing some hagiographic. Hey, it's a political analysis. I don't do history. I'm not interested in who was sleeping with who, and I'm not going to front like I would have took the shots at Campbell Hall. I want to build on them because they were theorists as well. And from your theory comes your strategy, because some folks are in it to win it. You know what I'm saying? So let me move. I really like uh, the, 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 the notion that what Sister Kathy said about their instruments and intellectuals of change really does that. Thank you so much. Could the revolution have been materialized? I'll just encourage you to go from pages 361 to 363. One of the reasons that people thought the revolution couldn't be materialized or they dismissed the possibility of revolutions, I would say, Brother Smith, and I so am, am, am appreciate Brother Rob's comments, because they focused on the wrong revolution. They think of guerrilla warfare. 
the people being waylaid by local police force. That's not what I'm talking about. Look at pages 361 to 363 of my book. Anyone don't have my book, send me an email. I made my book free before it was published. My second, the last book on uh, religion and world politics, all quantitative analysis, a real reason they ain't fired me yet, because I'm a black man who does quantitative analysis of international relations and war. I, said, um, uh, I made that free too. It strikes me when professors come up, they made a class analysis, but they don't know how to make their book free. You see what I'm saying? So that people can get an access, but send me a thing, I'll, I'll send you a link to it. So, the, the, so read pages 361 to 363, okay? Um, uh, uh, and also, you also see revolutionism in the church too. What did uh, Huey Newton say? He said, when the Black Panther Party, when we distance ourselves from the Black church, we distance ourselves from the Black community. Again, it's not to see revolution in its fullness. And some of it is to use as a distraction. People thought of, of Nat Turner, many people in the plantation thought he's a zip coon or Uncle Tom. But JT is right. The correct term would be zip coon. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he escaped and came back. Unlike Gabriel in Denmark, he only told four or five people. And he was one bridge away from getting to the great dismal swamp. But white supremacism won't just teach you what to think, but how to think. But I teach you not to turn as a rapist, just looking to rape white women. You won't even go to him to study uh, his strategy of liberation. Why does he strike with clubs and stuff in the night? Because it's nighttime, fool. He don't want to wake up nobody. What happens at daybreak? He puts his, his people in bandanas, get horses, yell in charge. He was one bridge away from getting to the great dismal swamp. White supremacists don't have to worry about you studying that Turner. Because if they teach you that there's nothing that, let me go now. Uh, uh, and most free program, most programs for free and political prisoners, most of them are in churches. <laughs> Ain't that something? Uh, and, and, and some of us, like, uh, the, the stuff, I've been citing Sundiata Coley's work since the 90s. It's political prisoners. We can cite them in our own work. That's why I'm not knocking other folks who study uh, theory. I'm not knocking Marx, Foucault. Uh, uh, I'm not knocking any of them. I'm saying, if, shouldn't I study the folks who made a way for my liberation, if we're st struggling for liberation? Shouldn't I build on what they did? And the slave revolution is there. Some folks are coming, I mean, I'm calling that. It's got less than a minute. Let me make this work. Um, the question is not asked. I appreciate Brother uh, uh, Spencer's comments too. If, the, the question of many of the Black politics didn't ask is what happens to white supremacism after Black president? This is what's missing. All these white supremacists, they found a proud white man, was male or the bride, Trump. Proudly white. You say, why didn't it happen with, with uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Romney. He's a Mormon. They, they, they don't even count him as a real Christian. I'm talking to white supremacists, don't. But a proud white man. And that's what you see on the Capitol. January 6th, there's whiteness. You see what I'm saying? We can come back to that. But that's what's not studied. Uh, brother uh, brother uh, uh, Spence, appreciate what you said. But, but, but mine, I get to Michigan as a grad student. We've already organized the Wayne State University as an undergrad as soon as I got out the Army. That's where I went. And I went to the Army because I had no... <laughs> prospects at 17 other than selling dope or doing some other things, which I wasn't going to do. But the uh, but it starts at Wayne State University, where we used to walk from the projects to Wayne State University. And my brothers and sisters were members of the Black Panther Party, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. It's not just that I have a fetish for Detroit either. It's building on what was there, OK? Um, there were Black professors that assisted. Charles Moody was one, and Harold Cruz was another at Michigan. But you're right that most of them didn't. And many of them were act actively worked against us. I won't say any names, James Jackson, who took my fellowship. Uh, uh, a white, uh, Dave, David Singer called him that day, got it right back. You see what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Ernie Wilson was another one. So these people worked against him. Uh, Kathy Cohen was not a leader of the, uh, the movement 86, 87, though she did support it. The steering committee was folks like Barbara Ransby, Regina Jemison, Lannis Hall, your frat brother, Lee Rudolph, your other frat brother, I'm talking about Brother Smith. Uh, Chuck Winder, uh, J.D. Simpson, Willie Latham, and you say these names, Roderick Lindsay, Rob Sellers, Sister Lauren, Pedro Shakespeare, there's these, these types of folks, okay? And it's important that we say these names, but there was a serious class fracture at Michigan, and I was commuting from Detroit. I drove 47 miles one way to go to uh, grad school in Michigan, because I was still going to leave on the east side of Detroit in the Black community and commute. I'm not knocking anybody who didn't, I'm just talking about my school. There's a serious class fracture. And we're not all trying to catch up. Catch up. I, I don't like that language of all and we. No, some of us are doing this and building on what other folks showed us how to do, OK? And that's important to get this uh, language, OK? So um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Earl. Uh, in order to get uh, a good seven, eight, 10 minutes of questions in, I'll just go right here to the floor. And um, anybody who has questions, please feel free uh, to unmute yourself, unmute yourself, and go ahead, and it's a free fall. It's jazz. It's black folk together. So go ahead. Hello. Uh, how's everybody doing? Great. All right. Um, I I have uh, some questions. 
um, concerning uh, 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 the, the faculty in terms of um, the, the black faculty uh, standing with the uh, student situations. Um, you know, I, I've studied a little bit. Um, I graduated from Howard University. So, um, you know, I, I, know, I know a little bit about the, the student activism, uh, 68 and, and 89, read about it. But um, I just want to know: is it is it now? Is it is it um, is it is it is there a uh, a fear of losing their jobs in terms of the the faculty? Because I've had some faculty who you know who taught me, but I kind of felt like when it comes down to it, the mortgage got to get paid. So that's why I feel with that uh, with that, and also concerning um, uh, black student concerning black faculty. Uh, at PWI, should should the black faculty uh, go to HBCUs or should they go to, to PWI? So I just want to know everybody's thoughts. Black faculty, like anybody faculty, should, should go anywhere they want. Uh, if you want to see how you engage, read Being Black at Penn State. And some of us who are activists, one of the biggest problems is that most professors were not activists. I'm not knocking them, I'm just describing. And most activists don't become professors. Uh, the rest of it, I, I, I leave to others. What, what would you what would you say about uh, and I don't want to get us distracted, but what would you say about Cornell West situation right now? What is that? I, uh, I think it's unfortunate that people don't see Cornell West probably done helped more black folks become professors than uh, uh, than, than Harvard has in the last twenty years. What, what 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 bothers me is they don't see what's that's indicative of. If Harvard would dare uh, not uh, have him considered for tenure, what do you think they do for the rest of us? And what do you think the other uh, universities will do, given what Harvard has done? Just uh, again, to look at, read Being Black at Penn State and put, look at my name next to it. And uh, to ask you, if you don't know it, you, you, now you know it. But that's what many of us who've been challenged these white supremacists from the beginning. So, so instead of talking about what people are afraid of, ex use the people who are fighting as examples. Who looks at a fight and say, like, let me look for what the losers are doing or the people who are afraid to get in the ring. Let me start from there. Look at the people who are doing it. So it doesn't have to be me. Look at a, a Garrett Felt. There, there's so many people who are doing it, and a lot of them black women. Um, and, and it's so important to engage that what J, Brother JT was saying, not just people who say what they were activists and what they did in their time, and there's so many. They're hidden in plain sight. Have a long discussion with Kathy Powell. Uh, Lester, I think the question in the chat was for you. Uh, it's asking a question about a, a, a statement I think you made uh, in your discussion about Black studies. Uh, and that's when I saw the question pop up. What is the question of Black studies? Please clearly say this uh, for me, uh, your, under, your understanding, thanks. Uh, yeah, so um, real quickly, Cornell West is not Harold Henderson. It's important to make an analytical distinction between those two. Cornell West is not Errol Henderson. On the best day of his life, he's not Errol Henderson. Uh, second is when I was making a broad stroke, just like I was making a broad stroke about black politics being backwards, of course it's not. I mean, we're, we're doing the work, we're black politics scholars. Uh, so I, I didn't mean to say black politics, you know, I was just, cause we, we're on Zoom. Doing something similarly black studies, what we've seen uh, simplifying is a significant shift away from the social sciences toward the humanities that starts around, the, uh, that starts probably mid to late 80s and continues to this day. And along with that move comes a subsuming of the political. So what they do is they begin the cater, they basically, they, we in effect lose the terrain of the political to, the, uh, to, to, uh, to black studies and it's humanities wing. And when the humanities wing of black studies is taking up the question of politics, what you do is you extend, po they, what they do is extend politics to the point where you can't make empirical distinctions between modes of politics. And then there's a certain type of, uh, and then that looseness generates really, really bad analyses. And then to the extent that we're interested in problem solving and making the world better, it generates really, really, really bad politics. And, I, and actually, and I'll say it, uh, I, I hate on Cornell West for other reasons, but Cornell West is actually <laughs> to that move. It becomes difficult to understand and articulate politics the way folks who are trained in black politics can study it because these folk are talking about it who have no expertise in talking about it and then have no real expertise on the ground on top of that. 
Yeah, please ask. I hope somebody uh, appreciate that. And I also ask you to uh, uh, take a look at uh, Brother Lester's uh, piece in Mother Jones, where you're applying um, uh, 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 analysis of, of cultural revolution in Mother Jones. I commend you that. I would argue, says, I don't want to turn this into Cornell West, but I'm going to come back to that. It, it's the, the fact is, is, is that it's Cornell West. That, that, that's the point. Um, it don't have to be uh, uh, in your own line, in your own, uh, uh, doing the kind of work you're, you're doing. It's what signal is Harvard trying to say? I'm not looking at, I'm looking at what Harvard is doing by doing that, by demonstrating that, look, we don't care who your super Negroes is, this is what we'll do to them, and this is what we do to you. I'm not saying you lose no sleep over it, but again, a, 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 an analysis of this, I think should begin with Harvard's policies toward black professors, and then black students, and then the Cambridge community, and then the Boston community. You know how many people in line before I get to Cornell West? That's what I'm saying. I have this kind of analysis. Just to accept a knee-jerk reality, I don't like the guy. Okay, I support a lot of folks like, and probably quote a lot of them too. So, so, but let me go back to this. Robin Kelly and uh, uh, had this piece on resolving, so-called resolving the conflict between Michael Dyson and Cornel West, as if this is a problem. As if white intellectuals don't argue all, uh, constantly. But black folks, this is a crisis. Right? But check this out. He said the resolution of the conflict between Dyson and Cornel West was what's unfolding in Jackson, Mississippi. See, that's under Shokwe Lumumba and now Shokwe Antar Lumumba, his son. He does this in this analysis. It, the, the entire analysis, he never mentions black nationalism. He's talking about Shokwe Lumumba. This is the son of the RNA, Napo, in Cobra, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, and he doesn't mention black nationalism. Most academics will not talk about progressive forms of black nationalism, much less revolutionary forms of black nationalism. To his credit, Lester Spence has, a, has an excellent article that he co-wrote co with uh, on black nationalism using empirical analysis. And I so vibe with what Les said about the people who are making these analysis that are not grounded in political science, not grounded in political analysis. But one of these things is also the political scientists who are not grounded in this history because how many people talk about the slave revolution? So when I put that in the book, it had to be somebody like brother Robert Smith because this book wouldn't be published with slave revolution if it wasn't for Robert Smith. See, and Robert Smith and I are going at it. You see what I'm saying? But that's what we're supposed to, to make me defend the point. What would you think would happen, talking about cultural revolution, if people were taught from the beginning there was a slave revolution, 196,000 of us fought in the Union War. And people say, in a civil war, how, how do you have it when you got a, the capitalist union? That, show me a war where you don't use allies. And those same people sit back and admire Lord Palmerston of Britain. <laughs> he said famously, Britain has no permanent friends or permanent enemies, but just permanent interests. What a strategist he was. But you can't conceive that black folk who organized the Underground Railroad, still in most of the property of these, uh, 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 of these uh, slavers, which was them, had the acumen to say when they would go and who they would formulate that. If you read William Webb, they're talking about this in 1856 publicly. It's no mystery. It's hidden in plain sight because white supremacists won't just tell you what to think. It tell you how to think. We don't go there for our liberation. Enough of us don't go there for our liberation. So how many have built on the Du Bois notion, the slave revolution, or have theorized it? I know a young brother. I think this brother, we ain't so young now, it's a, it's a enlightened brother, grounded in Black culture. But when he does a, a, a phenomenal book on Black culture, he's more interested in how culture reproduces domination. But why not look at how culture liberates you? Because our training, we're not trained to do that. Or we may not have the data to do that. I'm not mad at them. You notice I have no problem saying names, but some names I don't say, because that's not important. What this enlightened brother, what will compel that? Because many of us get into academia and we don't challenge the white supremacism that's quotidian, that's every day. That's what Kathy Powers was a constant reminder of to these uh, 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 white supremacists at, at, at uh, Penn State. She got dignity and pride and her competence is unquestioned. And if you look close enough, you'll see it's not simply competence, it's excellence. You see, they have a problem with that. You see what I'm saying? So this is part of the challenge. So we can, we can change this tomorrow. How, how do you change tomorrow, brother? Oh, come on, with our syllabi. Oh, that's a, so when I went, I'll, I'll stop here, brother. When I was presenting at Harvard, some Negro get up there, he's super uh, revolu ain't revolutionary, nothing. He ain't don't got to be. I'm just talking about how he fronting. He talking about what the Harvard students ain't this, ain't that. Why would you go to Harvard and say that? I said, you know what? What would happen if you all decided, this was several years ago, everyone here would decide your uh, seminar paper would be on reparations. What if Harvard black students did that? 
You may, first of all, it's going to make the news. <laughs> first of all, you, to use media strategically. But he's going to Harvard looking for Fred Hampton. I mean, no, you go to them where they are and transform them. And transform them using what? The thing that gets you the inroad. Culture gets you in. Hip hop gets you in. Not to stay there. I'm not saying Jay Z's a revolutionary. I'm not saying, but Prince Vince and the Hardcore Committee, uh, Mike Fresh, uh, uh, Chaos and Maestro in Detroit, they're organizing with revolutionaries, members of the Black Panther Party and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. How did that happen? See, so that's what's so transformative. And then the last thing I'll say, my, my work, I argue my work is a, is a work of policy. Policy doesn't have to go to the elite. This is the policy for those who are interested in revolution. So I'm saying, I don't say I'm a revolutionary. I just write books, OK? But I'm saying for those who are interested in this, that's something to study. And, if, and when they can see that certain humility, it bothers me when people say, there's a church, you know, a black community. You know what you find, a church on every corner and a liquor store. So you should know how to organize black people then. There's going to be a church and a liquor store. That's where I expect to find you. Go to the people where they are. But often folks are waiting for an a, 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 a organization to bless with their pristine presence to make change. What kind of change you ever heard of it come from that? But they're often not interested in making change. Why? They didn't come from black communities. They are interested in living in a black community. And if they're in a black community now, they're still apart from the black community, even in the middle of it. We making black communities here. All these white folks, the other part of cultural revolution is a cultural revolution among white folks. Now they're split, the Trumpists and the non-Trumpists. How do you use that to your advantage? How did they do it in the slave revolution? The abolitionists, is, but if I say divide and conquer, people say, yep, that's how black people are. You notice how we won our freedom, right? Divided white folks. <laughs> no white folks had as their initial war aim the freeing of blacks, uh, enslaved blacks. That was us. Empirically, that was us. You see? So let me stop. I hope you pick up the book. And again, I'll send it to you. It's free. I'll send it to you. Brother, Ke Brother Ke Kelly and then Sister Ife. OK, yeah, thank you uh, for that. And thank you all for your comment. So I, I, I want Earl and, 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 a, and a few of you others to, to respond to this. Um, Dr. Smith raised that question about could the revolution be, uh, if properly theorized, be materialized? But I, I, I'm thinking about um, Lester's comments too about incodes and this whole and black politics as a subfield. And, and Dr. Smith, you mentioned this and you even do this in your book um, uh, on American politics and the African American quest for universal freedom. Dr. Jones' um, frame of reference for black politics has been used really as a, a, a as a foundation for black politics for the subfield of black politics but it really mm -hmm. is a is a call for a black political science and not a subfield in white in, in american political science so there's a really a contradiction and i wonder that if we take this whole idea of being properly theorized that black politics and black political science and encopes itself hasn't been properly theorized and I, I want you all to, to, to talk about that, particularly around this whole question of liberation and what that means for us. Dr. Smith, did you want to respond to that? Wait, 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 because we we're time constrained. Why okay. don't we take the sister's question Okay. And have folks take those questions? Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hey, Earl. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to uh, Kathy Powers' comments about ADOS. I'm not, not quite sure what side of the fence she was on. I have a, little, a lot of issues with Ados, with the founders and their affiliations and uh, their divisions in the, the black community. But I wanna tie that to Earl because with W. Carr, of course we use reparations as a, a strategy for Pan-Africanism. So what do you see as the revolutionary potential of a global reparations movement? That's for who? That's for Earl and Kathy. Okay. I any other, any other questions? Any other questions you want to get in real quick? Uh, yeah, I can together. respond real quickly. It's in the book, Reparations, and I argue reparations is the major unresolved issue of social justice of our time. It's what slavery was, Jim Crow was in the next phase. Today it's reparations. So the book talks about that at, at some, uh, at some, to, uh, to, to a great extent. And so, other, it's, so it's central. <laughs> it's central. Any other questions or comments for the floor? Because uh, we want to get back to Kelly's question too. Can I take her, her question really quick? Sure. So thank you for it. Um, I don't get asked exactly what I think. So I'll tell you, I actually consulted Adolf, involved, um, invited to their clubhouse. Um, 
group, their room is 3,000 members in the reparations group. And so um, because I think that their definition is exclusionary, okay, um, at the same time, I think it recognizes the different pathways um, that we entered the United States. So they recognize that African Americans, that, uh, Black Americans didn't choose to come here, whereas other African um, immigrants have, and then your experience here is different. Uh, the problem with the definition is by excluding people in the African diaspora is causing contention. So what they ask you to do is to come in and talk to um, the Caribbean American community who is very angry and argues that their definition is anti-immigrant, is xenophobic. And I think what Ados wanted me to do was to defend them and say that they weren't. And what I've talked about was the consequences of exclusionary definitions and reparations. There's a long history, not in the African-American community, but the Jewish community in Bosnia, where these sorts of definitions have caused people within communities to engage in political violence. People are willing to kill, fight, and die over the question of racism. So what I caution Eidos about, and it's also Eidos' tone. So I was in um, Eidos' uh, clubhouse group the other day, and someone said, if you're black or white, and you don't support ADOS reparations, which is something very specific, I will kill you. And mm -hmm. so you have an extreme right sort of uh, wing of ADOS. And then you have the other side that says, you know, and what I suggest is can we have collaborations within the diaspora? Maybe we are seeking reparations, different kinds of different things, but when do we come together and, and collaborate? On your question of global reparations, and I think what you're asking is reparations at the diasporatic level the African diaspora. Um, it, it's not impossible, but difficult. And I think he gets back to Dr. Henderson's arguments about um, different, different um, levels of analysis, different mechanisms. When you can control the state and you can't, that leads to different strategies for seeking reparations. The other thing on the African continent, their questions about reparations are largely towards their own leaders right now. It started out being about slavery. And many of these questions are about holding their own leaders accountable. And so they're moving away from the centrality of the question of reparations for slavery that is dominant for the Caribbean who's using CARICOM, their regional mm -hmm. trade agreements to pursue reparations and for people in the United States who are seeking reparations, not just for slavery, but police brutality, the continuous systematic targeting of black folks in America since we came here and the police is one instrument. And so as far as like a diasporatic movement that includes the continent, that might be a bit more difficult, but at the same time, I'll leave you with this. I might be contradicting myself. Most people don't know that right after George Floyd was murdered, the Africa group and the United Nations Human Rights Council put forth a resolution calling for a truth commission and reparations for people of African descent for police brutality in the United States because the United mm. States withdrew in 2016. It passed unanimously and there's now a move to have a truth commission that was moved by African countries in the name of African Americans without African Americans even knowing that they mm. did it. So, so there's some hope for collaboration there and it's ongoing right now. And most of us don't even know it. What you ask is a much more complicated uh, answer, but I hope that gets kind of gets you started. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We're, we're already over time, but if anybody, so we, we already, uh, don't even worry about time now, obviously. Uh, does anybody else have a comment or a question related to what we're talking about here at the book? Uh, it's arguments, anything that uh, percolates from the book uh, as we are talking. Um, Errol, I, I, I'd be interested in you talking a little bit more about, um, uh, I had made a note. Um, could you, do, do we answer I, Brother I, I, I mean, it seems to me like if, if Haynes, if Haynes, wait, 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 Errol, can you answer Brother Kelly's question? Could you answer? Go ahead. Yeah, I, Brother Kelly, your take on Kelly's I thought question. it was for, for, for Brother Rob. I thought it was for Robert Smith, Brother Kelly's question. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Kelly, can you reset your question? Yeah. Well, my question, it, it, it really anybody could answer, but I did want to hear from Dr. Smith as well, um, is the whole, about this whole idea of being properly theorized and whether NCOPES 
and particularly black politics as a subfield, um, which really should have been a, a discipline itself, in my opinion, um, if that was properly theorized um, at the beginning of founding of ENCO and whole idea of liberation. I don't think that was properly theorized. I asked it better the first time around. Y'all made me repeat myself. The piece I wrote that's coming out in May addresses that. Um, it's called the, the, uh, the Politics of the Black Power Movement. And it talks about how we theorize and neglected certain areas. Um, and that's why Errol's book is so important. I think Errol's book fills a vacuum for us in political science um, around black power. Um, with the exception of We Have No Leaders and the works that Ron Walters did in terms of journal articles then inspiring um, other uh, political science really doesn't take black power um, forthrightly until the 1990s um, or later. Uh, and, and, and so how does that, you know, how, how did that happen? Like we were, we were the first people on the scene with Charles Hamilton of black power and yet black studies and history ends up um, engaging black studies and black, po black politics more. They don't theorize encodes, uh, but, we, but I think Robert Smith has theorized encodes. I think um, uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole uh, 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 Floyd Alexander, uh, uh, Alexander Floyd um, uh, has theorized encodes in a recent piece that she wrote and I try. Well, well to... if I may, real quick, if I may. So that's why with, what Lester uh, brought up uh, about Encope's first journal, the journal of political repression is, is so important. It's something that we need to respond to because we have to look at, well, what happened with Encope's? Encope's initially began as a means to liberate as an arm of this black you know, liberation. And my question is, did, did, was it properly theorized at that moment? Because initially we get into a journal that's clearly about dealing with the repression and we ditch it. See, because and, and it, it, it collides with this whole idea of professionalism. But I think I think the origin, the, the, the grounding of black power, or black politics and black studies, the origin's a little bit different in that, you know, the major disciplines like social the social science disciplines, history, they were already in the in the HBCUs and had people like Du Bois and um, you know, um uh uh uh, uh our own ambassador of, um, uh, I'm thinking of, um, I'm having a mental, uh, a mental moment. I'm thinking of uh, uh, our, our ambassador. I'm having a, <laughs> um, Ralph Bunch. Yes, thank you. I don't know why I couldn't think of Ralph Bunch's name. Of Ralph Bunch, you know, we had him. But in terms of, uh, you know, having the likes of, a, of a, you know, a, um, you know, someone like a Du Bois uh, or Carter G. Woodson, you know, we kind of come late, but we were already in the black universities. And then black political science is born at HBCUs. Black studies is born at white universities. And, and so the orientation, uh, Nicole Flo Alexander Floyd suggests, the mission of in Cope's generation was not to perpetuate the revolution, but it was to situate the discipline. Whereas black studies is at San Francisco State, at Merritt College, at these white student schools, trying to you know, fight the power. We didn't have to fight the power because the HBCUs already have political science. So our orientation, our, our, our sprouting up as a discipline is not so much adversarial toward the field as it was how to make um, political. But, but again, Brother James, that's why I raised that point that-, that Developing Smith programs going back to, you know- uh, but, that, but again, that's why I raised that point about black politics, the subfield and definition of it, Mac Jones is leaned on. And he talks about it being an adversarial relationship, right? And that there's a need for black folks to have liberation and a search for power. So it is adversarial in this whole idea of black politics. That's why, that's where, you know. Well, what and, I take, and, and I think, I'll let somebody else talk. Robert, go ahead. Robert, you got something, please tell me. Please tell me you got something to say. You're on mute. <laughs> Robert, Dr. Smith. Sorry. You're Robert, on mute, Dr. Smith. Mute. Robert, you're still on mute. Brother Smith. Take, a, take yourself off. I, uh, maybe I can do it. No, I can't. Dr. Smith, you're on mute. Can you hear us? I can do it. There you go. Uh -huh. there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a, I, I think, I think that uh, Jones's essay that you referred to, his article, 
which in some ways can be viewed as a inadvertently a kind of manifesto for the work of Incoach at its outset, said we needed to focus first on an unrelenting analysis of white supremacy as a kind of ideological superstructure for white domination of blacks. And then sustained analysis of that adversarial power relationship and how to break it in such a way as it would contribute to liberation. And as I look at the current generation of young black political scientists, young black studies scholars, I see that work going forward. I, I think I think they are doing across a range of disciplines, unraveling historically and contemporarily the nature of white supremacy. We learn more and more about it in all kinds of ways. And I think probably less so because it's more difficult to do empirically, this, this adversarial superordinate, subordinate power relationship between blacks and whites. So I, I am pleased that INCOPES, the younger generation of INCOPES people, scholars, are carrying forward that what are carrying forward that work in a way that 50 years ago I would not necessarily have anticipated. I would I would thought more of them would have been co-opted into the, you know, mainstream, blah, blah, blah. But even, I don't think they are. I, I think they're doing uh, good work. So I think the legacy from Jones's essay and from the initial notion of Black liberation scholarship, I think it's still pretty much alive and well among the younger generation. <clears throat> Especially in black studies, I, uh, I think, and, and amongst the historians, uh, some of the work being done on black power amongst the historians is just, you know, we got to catch up. <laughs> we yeah. have a lot, we have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, anyone else have a comment? Um, uh, there I might say also that right. we, our, our political leadership has, unlike, uh, White political leaders have not been willing to engage us scholars in a way. If they had this back to Earl theorizing, they they have not taken advantage of the theorizing that takes place in the black intellectual community and brought that to bear in their in their work, whether they are mayors or congressmen, etc. That kind of linkage. Uh, is not there in a way that I think if it was, there would be a much broader and more dynamic uh, black politics if the intellectual and the actual practice of it was kind of brought together, which is another idea behind the INCOPE's philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was gonna say, if, if Howard Cruz and uh, Haynes Walton had a baby. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> His name would be Errol Henderson. <laughs> That's it right there. They said it about, you know, they said it about Kobe, right? About LeBron and LeBron and uh, Jordan and uh, Magic Johnson. If Magic Johnson and Jordan had a baby, it'd be LeBron, right? This tall boy, like, basically Jordan, right? So I'm saying academically, you know, Harold Cruz. But that IR intervention is important. That was right? so when, when, when the university. Errol talks about that, that IR intervention, being trained as an IR scholar, is important. And so it's not Ali just Harold Cruz, it's not just Haynes, and Haynes, because Haynes was an Americas. It's that combined with IR scholars. So when you're talking about the IR scholars, you're talking about a number of, of some of them dope in their own way, white boys, but still they're, they're deeply, they, they train in a very specific way that's different. I mean, I went to grad school in Michigan too. I didn't get, you know, the way we were trained as Americanists is different than the way that uh, that the IR that the mm. world politics scholars are trained. So it's that it's that third person. So you had to add <laughs> you had that third person. Ali Masrui, brother. Yes, Ali. Mm -hmm. Ali is a combination of Ali Masrui and J. David Singer and Ken Organsky. 
Yes. I'm a quantitative scholar in world politics and the Correlates of War Project. And I've been a member of the Correlates of War Project since 1986. Yeah. And that's why my last book on religion and world politics published by Michigan is all quantitative with the head of the, uh, of, of, of the Correlates of War Project, Zev Miles now. So that's what's mm -hmm. important. Uh, the, and, and Les is, is, is exactly correct about that. Yes, sir. And, and that's yeah. where, you know, and that's where I think, so in a way, there are people doing this work now, but it's like we had this dip in the middle and what, what we're in, a, where, where for, this, for a long range of time, folks were studying questions about black politics that weren't necessarily, you know, when I say folks, I'm speaking broadly, I'm not, there were, there were folks asking questions that didn't necessarily, necessarily fit tightly with the realities of black life on the ground. And, and now, Les Finch was doing this uh, uh, two decades ago, organizing a, a conference as a political scientist on Harold Cruz's work. So he's doing this decades ago. You see what I'm saying? Doing quantitative work on black nationalism. What happens is they pathologize black nationalism. They got a universal thesis. They can't find nationalism being progressive or revolutionary anywhere unless it's Marxist, because that's how they train to be. They don't deal with the peculiarity of the national development of African Americans in the most powerful country in the world. If nothing else, that could be, uh, it, it suggests it may be a little different, but, uh, but black nationalism can only be presented as pathology unless it's, unless it's Marxist. Meanwhile, they incorporate all types of, of theoretical art. So they'd rather take Gramsci, who never studied the United States. I ain't mad at him. He in one of Mussolini's prisons. Hates the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is the, is, is the fascist, uh, is the right wing. I understand that. But the church in, in the United States ain't the same thing. So when you bring it wholesale into the United States, you miss it. But you got to stumble over Du Bois, uh, 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 Elaine Lott. Ida B. Wells, Anna Julia Cooper, uh, you got to stumble over all these and discard them and say, no, I'm going to take this. I'm not mad at them. You know how people say, well, they only went to the church because that's the only place we can congregate. If you mad, if you if you quarrel with the United States during the, uh, during, after World War II, who you going to go to? Costa Rica? Well, you go to the, the, the state that's opposed to them, the USSR, and you got to buy into that. I, I'm not mad at them. I'm saying we can't afford 50 years later not to learn from this and not to act like we've learned from this. So that's why it's a shame to build on this work and to do it where I'm still got to argue with folks about the slave revolution or the folks know they're not putting that on their syllabus. They're not going to study it. They're not going to do it in American politics. To talk about the slave revolution. But we have Cynthia McCurry. If you read the book, her Confederate Reckoning, she says, even Jeff Davis says my verbatim, my slaves are in revolt. <laughs> That's what he says. So, so Steve Hahn says this in A Nation Under Their Feet in 2004. He won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Du Bois says this in 35, 36, and not building on that. So they did, it didn't materialize. It wasn't theorized because it wasn't going to be a guerrilla warfare in some third world backwater. I'm not mad at him. I'm not to be disparaging. So it may have been Michael Collins and the, uh, the IRA may have been more salient than Che Guevara. At least Collins, if he's not in the belly of the beast, he's in the small, the large intestine, right next to Great Britain. And he's gonna organize, they didn't even know what that man looked like. And he brought Great Britain to the, to the table. You need something like that when you're talking about the most powerful country in the world. Where do I get stuff like that? Because I talked to Robert Williams. I talked to Mario Obadiah. I talked to uh, Shokwe Lumumba. I talked to Queen Mother Moore. I talked to Amiri Baraka. So uh, you study and learn from them. You see what I'm saying? And then build on it. And Max Stafford. Max Stafford has been such a help. Akua and Jerry. Safia Bukhari Austin. These people, who they, they don't fetishize revolution. And General Baker. General Baker, if I could just say this. I said, General, because the lead comes closest. You heard my critique. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti-Marxist. I just don't think it's applicable here. But, but, but they're a black Marxist organization. I say they come the closest to capturing what Du Bois and Locke's thesis suggest. It's a black Marxist organization. I asked General. I said, General, how do you ask about a, a, a certain question? And he said, um, y'all had Harry Haywood was living with John Watson at one time. Why didn't you build on his thesis? He said, brother, we didn't know nothing about Marx. He said, we didn't know that until we until the end. Then we studied it. Who is honest like that? You rescue me, Brother James. You ain't gonna get that from Elaine Brown. Okay. You're not gonna get that from Bobby Seale. You're not gonna get that. But General Baker, why? Because General Baker is organizing with us. We organized with the homeless with General Baker in the Jeffries Projects in Detroit in the late 80s. We organized around the killing of, of kids with General Baker. You see what I'm saying? So these are people who are organized with, not in the 60s. I ain't trying to claim nothing. I, this in the 80s and 90s. 
That's why the study of the urban peace and justice movement, we will talk about this later on, the study of Save Our Sons and Daughters, many of these initiatives oriented by black women, and what are these black women saying? Uh, go back to Kathy Powers. They're saying the U.S. cannot even provide for the physical security of its children. That's what makes it a human rights issue beyond stopping the violence. But when I would say that to Ms. Barfield, she would say, Brother Earl, tell us again, tell me again how what we do is a cultural revolution. <laughs> and, and Grace Boggs wouldn't even use the term. Only toward the end of her life did Grace have dropped it, but she goes back to Castro writers and these other Marxists, not mad at them. But why wouldn't you go to the boys? So her and I would argue. James and I didn't argue like that, but James had been gone, see? But people who build it on their work, they keep them static, ossified in a time so they can make an archive. Look, our history is too important to be left to the historian. And I vibe so much with Les Fitz when he says it. You need political analysts. It's not history. It's not narrative history. And Malcolm says, we'll call her verbatim. We'll call on students of political science. I take that literally. You see what I'm saying? So I, um, we have to be conscious of the next group that's coming in. And, um, and um, thank you all. So, but thank you all so much. I could never even imagine doing this, that y'all would do this with my work. I'm so appreciative. Oh, much respect and such appreciation to all of you all. I'm thank glad we were able to pull this off. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, everybody who participated. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks. Great job. Thank you, everybody. All right. That's my sister from Europe, Sister Olivia, <laughs> by way of Rwanda. I see you, Sister Olivia. And Sister Ife, always a. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Thank hey, you so Earl, much. Hey, Earl, real quick, what's up on the, uh, what's up on the follow up volume? Oh, Lord. It's becoming, uh, it's coming. I'm talking about it a little later today. But oh, my goodness, Brother Les, this is different. This is different kind of writing. But I got this other one on racism and international relations theory that I think you would dig because it goes right into the theory. But the one on the uh, that, that 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 builds on a political analysis of what I call the ignored culture revolution and so sad, brother Les, that one that, it's, it's hard to write, brother. So so real quick, me and Robbie Shilliam are writing this a proposal to bring up to bring in people to talk about the right to the city. That's Lefebvre, you know, uh, white boy, and then James Boggs, the city's a black man's land. Oh yeah. Right, so and hopefully you bring in Carl Nightingale, the third ghetto, because that's what the folks miss, the third ghetto. Yeah. So what I'm thinking about, so I'll put his name in, but we'd love if we end up getting a loop, we'll bring you down. Oh, I appreciate that. And in and in the book, I engage Carl Nightingale in my critique at following Boggs in the city as the black man. Yep. Uh, brother, if you read, you see, I try to bring in everybody because I'm going around to them, talking to them, getting their feedback and engaging with them and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so that'd be up. beautiful, man. That's wonderful that you're doing that at, at, at Hopkins. And you see that one little, uh, that, that my little needle, because I got to needle you a little bit. Uh, 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 but it also is a reminder of, of for, for me too, uh, Brother Les, how we get trained in ways that are like presuppositional. Because we're being told, we come up with these questions and they're like, well, no, you got to tweak it like that. And these are advisors, so we take the tweet, but then we go back and say, oh, and I'm looking at you, Les, I'm like, Les a DJ. He go wherever the music, he control the music. Can't nobody send Les this way. He send the dancers on the dance. Les is a maestro. He can't act like he's the third violin, just follow this, he's the maestro. So that's the spirit of it, brother Les. And thank you for bringing those people back into the conversation. That's real. I I'll talk to you soon. Okay, take care. I'll see ya. All right. You all take care. Bye-bye.